We have a next session that's starting, uh, which says getting ready for 100 lakh crores. As we put in place the products and the investor segments to reach our target of 100 lakh crores, it is important to have the infrastructure and technology in place to process the humongous growth in volumes. So let's hear it from Mr. Anuj Kumar, MD CAMS. He joined CAMS as CEO in 2016 and saw rapid ascent and took charge as president and CEO within a span of two years and is presently the managing director. Under uh, Mr. Kumar's stewardship, CAMS operations have gone exponentially across all business dimensions to serve 27 lakh crore assets, which represent 70% share of Indian mutual fund industry's assets. Ladies and gentlemen, absolutely thrilled to have him here. Please put your hands together for Mr. Anuj Kumar. Morning. Have you put this up? Yes. Sir. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gen <coughs> gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here amongst you again after a hiatus of what looks like uh, almost three years. Uh, was a regular attendee of Confluence in the past and uh, very pleased to be amongst you today. Uh, when Prem and I spoke and he offered that um, I should speak about the vast opportunity that lies ahead of us, uh, the number of 100 lakh crore has been spoken. This is not the first time it's been spoken about. It's been spoken about uh, many times. And what I thought was that uh, I would do a bit of a storytelling, but also interweave this with the data and trends, because when we started looking at the data, again, not for the first time, some very, very interesting trends emerge. Some very, very compelling insights are available. There are times when you feel like patting yourself on the back, and there are times when you do get the feeling that uh, it's a path ahead that we have to traverse together. So why don't I begin? And uh, obviously, I know that uh, you know, this is about a 15, 16 minute presentation, but happy to interact with you or any one of you after we are done here. So I'll begin. And uh, I want you to look at these numbers. These numbers are known to all of us, but uh, if you look at the 10-year period, and I'm talking of 2012 to 2022, we've uh, partitioned this into two parts. The first five years, which is 2012 to 2017, and the number you see over there is a growth rate of 23%, which is a fantastic growth rate for any product, any market, uh, in any country, any part of the world. And I guess that happened because the base was small, as the base became larger, as we went more towards 2017, you see a, almost a 18 and a half, 19 lakh crore AUM. The growth rate since then has been 15%, which again, given a large base, uh, is fairly credible. Everyone who's present in this room, uh, all of you and all of us uh, have opportunity to feel proud about this and feel happy. Uh, when you look at the bottom, and I think that's very heartening, one number that we continue looking at in this industry is net sales. Equity net sales is, is perhaps the number to look at in this industry. It tripled from 2.5 lakh crore in the first five-year period, five year period to 7.5 lakh crore, which is creditable. Identical periods, five years and five years. 2.5 lakh crore tripling to 7.5 lakh crore. The question to ask is, in the next five or six years, are we doing enough to make it triple again? Will it go that way? Or will it be smaller or will it be larger? Uh, time will tell, but I think a uh, heartening number. Non-equity largely comprising fixed income uh, depends upon what corporate treasuries are thinking and how uh, intensely debt products and others are being uh, kind of sold in the market. Uh, probably a little flattish from about uh, 4.3 to about 5.5, but I think collectively uh, a good story to think about. When you look at when we partition the market into just two parts, individuals and non-individuals. This used to be an HNI institutional market earlier. Every year you will see, what you see in September 2017, institutions were still majority. Institutional money was more than 50% of the Indian mutual fund market in 2017. Every year it is contracted by about 2%. September 22, when you dial forward a uh, month back, Institutional money is down to 43% from 52. Individual has grown from 48 to 57. I think one single picture of a base emerging, a large base emerging is this. 
that individual monies are now bigger than institutional monies and continue to expand and grab share at the rate of 1% to 2% every year. And what you see on the right, uh, unique investors in the MF industry, I know when you juxtapose this with DMAT accounts and direct equity, et cetera, some of us feel these numbers are not great. Look at them in a standalone manner. From inception to 2017, at least a 20-year period, one and a half crore unique investors came. Next five years, over two crore came, which means 1.5 and 2, 3.6. What happened in 20 years has been significantly overtaken in the next five years. The question to ask is, in the next five years, are we going to beat these numbers again, completely out of the room and out of the ground? And that's entirely possible depending upon uh, how this entire fraternity decides to move forward. I wanted to look at the right-hand side of the market uh, of the chart. And this is a good exposition of India as a marketplace, whichever product you take. So we started thinking about small SIPs, and then we thought about small size products. And shampoo sachets came in mind, where anyone who's dealt with any FMCG player knows that FMCG players were trying to penetrate this market for decades. Selling expensive bottles could make it. Today, 70% volume share of the shampoo market comes in the three and four rupee sachet. And I guess that's a good indicator because it is the same person who's going to buy our product. That to think that AUM will come in large lumps is perhaps uh, a little ambitious. It will come in small lumps. We will sell small SIPs. We will get investors who will give us a few thousand rupees initially. And then they will scale. And one good example, when you, say, when you look at the left-hand side, and this is very recent data. We are talking of just four years. FI19, which is 1819, 11 million, 1.1 crore SIPs, growing to 1.2 during the COVID phase, 1.4, and then 2.7 crore SIPs in one year. And a lot of congruence, while we don't have data to intersect these two sets, and tell you where are the common people, I can tell you intuitively these are perhaps common markets. So when you approach them in the small cities that we come from, I know a lot of you live in uh, Delhi and Mumbai and Pune, etc. But when we think of the hinterland and when we think of the small investor, I think the core characteristic of India that the small investor, small consumer is going to define the market. 70% market share in shampoos is the sachet. We would perhaps go the same way. And instead of being the top of the pyramid kind of market where the HNIs and large institutions dominate, this will continue going down. Yeah, and we will see how this pans out. Uh, what vindicates this, again, to the left-hand side? FI17, SIP collections, just over 40,000 crore. FI22, almost triple to a lakh and 25,000. And I think most of us see that monthly number when it comes out. Uh, I don't want to make forward-looking statements, but will not be too far when this number gets to, let's say, 1.5 lakh crore. And therefore, whatever we've sold, whichever customers we've brought, uh, are contributing to this kitty. And this is the kind of momentum which can move the entire industry forward and start looking at the frontiers that we are talking about, 100 lakh crore, 100 trillion. Mm -hmm or even beyond. Why just think of 100 trillion? Why not think of things beyond? Uh, the industry sells in 19,000 plus pin codes. So particularly you know, across the country, whether we call it B30, the hinterland, tier two cities, whichever name they go under, I think very, very well penetrated. And that's again a job uh, that we've done collectively in this room. One thing which has led to all this, it could not have happened. And, and that's not just wishful thinking or uh, a statement without foundation. Without technology in the way we used to work five or seven years back, would have been impossible. We would have never done it. You can see the data at the left. Onboarding between 19 and 22, I'm not even showing you a five-year trend. This is three years, FI19, FI20, 21, and 22. What used to be? 60%, 58% paper-based onboarding has shrunk to 20%, one-third. 58% has gone down to 20% from 19 to 22. 
and the platforms, websites, apps, this is not necessarily FinTech platforms, this could be others, AMCs, RTAs, many others, uh, are now contributing to 80% investor onboarding. Most of this is 100% tech, which means no paper really comes in, no piece of check comes in. That part is really contracted, and you know that new investor onboarding was always a cumbersome process in our industry, but significantly solutioned, significantly solved, based on what you see here. And when you see the right-hand side, the transaction trends, this is CAMS data, about 150 million transactions, almost tripling in five years to 420 million, or over 42 crore, 98% transactions. A large lump of this is SIP triggers, but if you include all kinds of transactions that we get, 98% are digital or electronic. So that train left the station many years back, not even talking of uh, embracing technology or evangelizing or any of that. Without this, without these bedrock kind of platforms, APIs, websites, apps, new ways to engage consumers, there is perhaps very little of the future left. And from an MF distributor point of view, I think despite what has happened in the market, uh, it's very heartening. In this period, the last 12-year period, direct plans came in and a lot of consumers started interacting directly. The RAs and the fintechs came in. I just wanted to look at the green slice of the pie, uh, which shows up at the right. MFDs occupied 24% assets of the industry in 2010 despite the upheavals, despite the changes. When you dial forward in 2015, again, 24%. Pairing a little down to 21%, but I think still, I would still call it holding share. So despite the changes, despite direct interaction platforms, plans, all of that, I think the, the small to medium distributor has held share over a long period of time, and there is no reason now for us not to hold share or, and for any of the trends to change further, and I'm showing you all this just to give you a context because this kind of data does get presented in a lot of articles, but we just thought it's a nice way to put all of this together. To show you how, you, how we came from the past in the last 10 or 12 years, and then I'll talk about how we will go forward in the next five to 10 years. Again, a little about automation, technologies, uh, service transformation, et cetera. Uh, you know that there are no touch redemptions, past complaints or money going into wrong accounts, accounts not being set up, reconciliation errors. All of that has gone out of the window. Again, there is no data-backed research, but I can tell you amongst the many industries that I've seen in my life, perhaps the least complaining of industries in, in which things go wrong uh, very, very few times. I think the entire bedrock of automation, APIs, uh, proprietary algorithms, all of that has contributed to uh, where we have come now. What has this done together? And again, on the global ranks, we believe while India's rank has improved a little, so when we started looking at data, uh, we moved up from position number 18 to position number 16 in terms of mutual fund size and penetration, but in a 63 trillion US market, we're still about half a trillion, so you can do the math, which means that the headroom to grow, and I'm sure you've heard that all day, so I don't want to belabor that point too much, but the headroom to grow from a macro penetration perspective, how much money is out there and how much money are we getting, uh, it's, it's absolutely a clinching argument that there's a lot more to be done. I'll speak a little about uh, what are the growth opportunities, what are the drivers, as the theme says, driving to 100 lakh crore. I want you to see this data. Uh, did I skip one? Look at this data. This is millennials, and I don't know how many of them we interact with, but I just want to show you one data. 2019, 20% of the Indian MF industry's base was millennial customers. In 2022, it is 8%, 28%, 8% up from 20 to 28. The question you have to ask yourself is, is this the group we are going after? Is this a group which is mostly on the self-help, do-it-yourself kind? on the platforms, what do we do differently? Because this will continue growing. Are we tapping into this maturing class? Are we digitally tooled completely to go after this? 20% to 28%, you can see the numbers. Women investors, 
And when we did our women investor study, you only need to look at one number. 1.8 billion or 18 lakh women investors in five years expanding to 55 lakh. And there are AUM numbers, et cetera, which I'm not showing right now. They're available. And again, look at this. From women being surrogates of a family where the family was just using her name to invest. These are independent decision makers out there. The question to ask is, are we going after them? Did we induct a woman investor by ourselves? NRI investors, third class. Now, I know that NRI cannot be everybody's remit. It's a very specialized class of investors, not easily accessible to everyone. But again, looks very interesting from the lumpiness of the investment that they make. And you can see the numbers, uh, just short of one lakh new folios created, almost 35,000 crores of gross sales. Very, very large number. The fourth number, so I spoke about millennials, about women, about NRIs. The fourth number I'll speak about, the investment classes, transmitted assets. In this industry of 3.6 crore people, two to two and a half lakh investors do not survive into next year. When they don't survive into next year, one third of them, and you can see the number there, we are losing those investors. They walk out. They take the money and walk out. Are we doing enough? And I think intuitively it means that we should go to them and try to raise the bar in terms of how much they're investing with us, but we lose one third of the investors. Again, uh, something to chew on for everyone here in terms of what we want to do in the future with these classes. Again, this number I've shown in uh, many presentations in the past, but just for your consumption, more than half of our investors haven't started an SIP yet. Half of them haven't started an SIP. After all the press and media and PR around SIP, why is that and what can you do there? We started looking at our SIPs over one crore with greater than three year tenure, haven't changed the amount. Despite all the top ups and all the step ups and every technology available to step these up, amounts are going, aren't going up. You see compensation, salaries, income going up. One big tool in our hands is it's a loyal customer. He's making money in the industry. Step him up. And then the last one where the SIP expires, somebody came in, did a three year or a five year term and then went out. A lot of them, despite the fact that they've made tons of money with us, haven't started a fresh SIP. A lot of them haven't pulled money yet, which means he never wanted to pull money, but we've probably not focused on him or her as much as we should have. And I think these are sub-components of what will take us to 100 lakh crore, but to us, to me, it looks like a very, very straightforward, sitting duck kind of opportunity to go after the market. Asset class penetration, 77% of our investors are in equity, which is good news. Only 19% have multiple asset classes. The balance have to be sold other asset classes. We haven't sold fixed income to them. So half of them haven't started an SIP yet, investor base. 19% uh, are multiple asset classes, the rest have single. And 77% have only equity. When you look at the, at the right-hand side, fund house exposure, Telling story, more than half the investors have exposure to one fund house. So when we talk about diversification, assets, retiring people, annuity requirement, et cetera, have we done enough? Or is this a large base to continue going after? Because that can give us just a lot more engagement into the same client account. The client hasn't given us serious money. At least this is what the data says. Of course, you guys are closest to them. You are in a physical situation. We are looking at data. But data does make us believe that there's a big opportunity out there. And uh, I'm being signaled that I should wrap up, so I will wrap up. Look at the geographic potential. We say B30, we say that B30 needs incentivization, we need more push. Just simple gross sales data. In 2017, B30 contributed to 9%. You can see the data here. In 2022, for individual investor gross sales, the contribution was 22%, two and a half times. New folio creation, B30, 39% of the new folios came from there. So outside of the big cities, this is the opportunity. There is internet, there are smartphones, there are disposable incomes, there is information, there is ability to you know, transact the way you like on the go. They need good advice and good engagement. And therefore, I'll wrap up now in terms of uh, what do we do next? Mega trends. Obvious, uh, mutual funds has a product being accepted a lot, lot more. Digital adoption has increased to levels beyond most places in the world. So we've got to capitalize upon that. 
emerging investor classes, I spoke about millennials, spoke about women, spoke about uh, NRIs, and spoke about investors who are holding on to transmitted assets, not staying with us long enough. B30 opportunity is very, very underserved, or significantly underserved. And then from a diversification, uh, upsell, cross-sell perspective, how do we get people to start as happy where they haven't? How do we get them to buy fixed income where they haven't? How do we get them into multiple asset classes, I think, is an op obvious opportunity. Digital is the new normal. Self-service is the way to do business. We cannot be different to how a person is booking a holiday or booking a ticket or ordering groceries. He will go that way. So how do we continue engaging with him while getting him into uh, smarter formats of how he used, used to dealing with industries? And then while, I mean, there's no reason to believe that the fintechs are better or the old strategies are better. I think everyone has a place. But some of the stuff that they are doing, I think, is just suits the preferences of the masses out there and how do we engage uh, with the consumers the way the fintechs have done. So that's all that I had. I know I've exceeded time, and I hope you found this interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs>